that uh, SCB has organized this good topic, a debate on democracy and dissent. Before I talk about the topic two minutes, I wish to congratulate and convey my gratitude to my Lord Justice Deepak Gupta for agreeing to address this inaugural lecture. I feel it is very important for students. I am so happy to see so many students here. For your information, Justice Deepak Gupta did his schooling from St. Edward Schools and Law from Faculty of Law, Delhi University. He practiced in High Court of Himachal Pradesh and handled constitutional, commercial and environmental matters. Interestingly, very interestingly for us, he was the President of Himachal Pradesh High Court Bar Association. He is an active environmentalist and filed number of public interest litigations. Justice Gupta was appointed permanent judge of High Court of Himachal Pradesh in October 2004. He was elevated as first Chief Justice of High Court of Tripura on 23rd of March 2013. Marriage Justice Gupta was elevated as judge of Supreme Court on 17th of February 17. He is fond of reading, walking and is an avid photographer and a keen interest in landscape and wildlife photography. Number of landmark judgments he delivered, you all know, students would know. Most important is in T.N. Gavardhan versus Union of India. He also dealt with issues of pollution, including Delhi pollution in MC Mehta case. In the alarming rise in the number of reported child rape incidents, he said that will lead to designated POXO courts in every district of the country and something which is very close to my heart and for the topic today we were discussing is dissent is not only in democracy dissent most importantly which rarely comes in judicial verdicts in Roser Matthew versus South India Bank Limited and others five judges bench my Lord Justice Gupta delivered a dissenting judgment wherein he highlighted the issue of tribunalization of justice he held that tribunal services must be there to selected persons to man the tribunal and such tribunals must be totally independent and be selected by independent body. With respect to appointment of retired judges to such tribunals, Smiler Justice Gupta observed, and I quote, if the administration makes appointment and judges serving or newly retired judges are under consideration for such posts, then the independence of judiciary is likely to be compromised. One cannot expect justice from those who on the verge of retirement throng the corridors of power looking for post-retired post positions. We are really grateful, my lord, to have you here. I will request Mr. Vice President to say a few words before I invite my lord Justice Gupta here. I will take exemption from saying a few words and request our convener and our person who's organized this, Senior Advocate Chandar Uday Singh, to speak on what he has done. Chandar, can we request you to come, please? <laughs> Welcome. One more ground he's taking for my not speaking is that we've known him for 40 years, known each other. So bias. Oh, so bias. <laughs> I welcome. Honorable Justice Deepak Gupta and our learned Attorney General, the President, Vice President, Secretary, all the office bearers and members of the Executive of uh, SCBA. Most of all, I welcome all our friends from the bar, senior and junior, who have, uh, um, I think, uh, on a Monday afternoon, it's either very difficult to get away because some learn uh, benches are still sitting or it's difficult to get away because you have other conferences and things scheduled. So I, we really appreciate the effort made by everybody. I also um, uh, appreciate the fact that um, the law faculty of Delhi, uh, the uh, Jindal uh, and Jindal, Jindal Global uh, uh, Law University have actually made a great effort to send some of their senior students because the, the moment they heard the subject and the name of the speaker, they said this is an opportunity not to be missed. And uh, so I welcome all the students here. I'm going to, uh, uh, like Kailash, beg off from saying anything because I think uh, whatever has to be said 
must be said by the speaker of the day. And so I'll uh, ask the secretary to welcome Justice Deepak Gupta. Thank you, Chandaji. I'll request Pavni ma'am to come on stage and present bouquet to my Lord Justice Deepak Gupta, please. Our senior member, Pavni. I'll request our dynamic uh, Rohit Pandey, Assistant Secretary, to present bouquet to the Attorney General, please. <laughs> I'll request Dr. Ritu Bhardwaj to present bouquet to man behind this great effort to see, see you sing convener. <laughs> Let me have descent here also <laughs> and request Reena Rao to present bouquet to Dushanji and our Minish, please you come and present. Sir, I said, I said, <laughs> descent, let us have descent. So we are, they are welcoming you, sir. <laughs> Minesh, you please come and present bouquet to the Minesh to Kilashi. Bouquet, bouquet, di jina, hat to mila di. Just a couple of lines I wish to introduce to students on this democracy and dissent. Dissent uh, is very important, not only in democracy, even in family. But how you say it is very important. I mean, you can't tell your dad, dad, aapko nahi pata kya hota hai. Aap usko jomane ke hai. No, no. Dissent is important. Dissent is important, definitely. But dissent should be, dissent should be said in a way ki unko pata bhi chale, wo khafa bhi na ho, itti atiyat se koi dil ki baat kaise kare. Dissent should be in a positive way, in a decent way, a decent dissent. I mean, you can say your point, but dissent should be like Prashanji is here and Maji Sahib and Deepak are here, they are talking of democracy. You have to think of that dissent in what context? Dissent to achieve the mission of preamble. If that is the mission that we are to achieve, the mission of preamble, we are to keep in mind that so many satar admi, jab talak nasaz hai, dil pe rakkar haath kai do kya vatan azad hai. You have to think on this, that dissent, why I am dissenting, not for the heck of it, no. What is my mission, what is my purpose, you all must have read. If the purpose is higher, if the purpose of dissent is higher, you maintain better health, you may maintain better intellect, your intuitive power improves if the purpose is higher. So with this background, I will request the star of the day, my Lord Justice Deepak Gupta, he has too much to say, I know. And we welcome my Lord Justice Gupta to have this in mind. A very good afternoon to all of you. Mr. Dushan Dave, President of the SCBA, and the other, other office bearers, Mrs. Yu Singh, the chairperson of the organizing committee, learned attorney general, learned senior advocates, members of the bar, and their students. Democracy and dissent. This was the topic, but I, the outside, I may say that I have also added dissent in judiciary, in decision-making process in the judiciary, because I thought that is also very essential because one of the core aspects of democracy is judiciary, and we have to have a fearless judiciary if we have to have a democracy. I've been a in the profession for 42 years, much less than the Attorney General, but much more than many of you here. And out of these 42 years, for 26 I've been a lawyer, so I still think I'm 66% a lawyer. And sometimes you see it when I argue with you in court. Uh, you know, I, what I miss, uh, what I've really missed in the 16, 17 years on the bench is the bar. 
what happens in the bar room can never happen in any other place. About three, four months after I had taken oath as judge, I went to my chief justice and said, I am having second thoughts, I feel like resigning. He said, what's happened? I said, I missed the bar room. <laughs> so, that was the level that I was, because you feel very isolated in your chambers, especially when you're a junior judge and can't even walk into a senior judge's chambers without an appointment, so to say. Coming back to the topic, I mean, talking, talking about descent to the bar is like taking coals to Newcastle. The bar is that most unholy of places where nothing is sacred. Where no reputation is so unimpeachable that it cannot be blown to smithereens. No personality so towering that it cannot be brought cr crashing down. No character so pure that it cannot be torn to shreds. We do everything in the bar. There's no idea so holy, so sacred that it cannot be challenged. And we have arguments, we heated arguments, sometimes aggressive arguments, but by and large they always end up with a shared cup of coffee or tea. And that is the beauty of a dissent which is on ideas and not based on power or anything else. It's a, when it's a clash of ideas, there has to be a dissent. When I talk of dissent in democracy, I think this most beautiful of books which we have, the Constitution of India, I always refer back to it. And the preamble has adorned my table in the chambers the day since I became a judge. And any time I feel difficult in finding a solution to a problem, I read the preamble again and I more often than not find the answer to my, uh, uh, solution to my problem. And what have we promised to ourselves? Liberty of thought, expression, belief, faith and for worship. I'll leave aside faith and worship for the time being, being more religious in nature. But liberty of thought, expression and belief. Because the belief can be an agnostic belief, it can be an atheist belief also. Now read it in conjunction with article, the first three clauses of article 19, which all citizens shall have the right to freedom of speech and expression. To assemble peaceably and without arms. To form associations or unions. When you read all this together, what does this constitution guarantee? It guarantees to you, which for me is the most important right under the constitution, not clearly written down, but the right to dissent. This like the right to privacy, which has been read in, Puto, uh, in, this case, in the Putuswami case, as evolving out of the other rights, is also a, the right to dissent, the right to disagree, the right to have another point of view, inheres in every individual, not only because of the constitution, but because it is a human right to disagree. As Mr. Roda said, and I had this in my part of my speech also, that those of us who are married know very well what dissent is. <laughs> we more often than are, are on the losing side, but we still welcome dissent. Any decision in a family also has to be a decision, a decision, informed decision of the entire family. We can't have the decision of the patriarch taking place in today's world. So it has to be an informed decision. And more often than not, unlike what Mr. Roda said, you are, the children will tell you that you don't know anything. We know what we, uh, what we can do and what we will do in life. And they have been right. At least in father, my children concerned, the decision they've taken have proved to be right. So the right to dissent, the right to disagree forms part of any human being's rights. But I chose this topic when we were very, many topics were given to me because of what is happening and what is troubling us in the country today where dissent is termed to be something like as if you're an anti-national or a traitor to the country. Just because you ho hold a contrarian view does not mean that you are uh, disrespectful to the country. You may be disrespectful to the government or the powers that be, but the government and the country are two different things. I am, but more why I am troubled is because I see members of the bar in various parts of the country 
thankfully not the SCBA, but various parts of the country, bar associations passing resolutions that in such and such matter they will not appear because it is an anti-national. <laughs> I'm sorry that goes against the provisions of the Advocates Act. It goes against the provisions of the Bar Council rules and the rules which basically the very as advocates we cannot refuse to give legal aid to anybody. And then when bar associations passed this, so I thought I'd take this opportunity of sending a message to the bar association in the country that this is not done. It was the members of the bar who were in the forefront of the freedom movement. The civil rights movements, they've read all sorts of movement. And at this stage to say that we will not even appear for somebody charged of certain offenses is totally unacceptable. This is in fact amounts to an obstruction of the judicial delivery system. We've talked about dissent as constitutionally there, also as dissent as a human right, but dissent is the very basis of a society. See, when we travel from a totally, say, 5,000 years back to from a really agrarian, rural society, in the Stone Age, developing further. Each society has its own rules, and over a period of time, those rules become the laws of that society. And that society will not develop if somebody does not question the rules. That society will become a stagnant society if nobody challenges what, hap what are the accepted norms. If we all follow the well-trodden path and refuse to think beyond, there will be no expansion in the vistas of the mind as we progress further. If we do not ask questions and do not challenge age-old customs, there would be no new thought. Whether it be Buddha, the Mahavir, Jesus Christ, Prophet Muhammad, Guru Nanak Dev, Martin Luther King, Kabir, Raja Ram Mohan Roy, Swami Dayanand Saraswati, Karl Marx or Mahatma Gandhi. They all challenge accepted norms and it is only because they challenge accepted norms that new thought came in. We may or may not agree with the thought, but new thought will only come in if you challenge old thoughts. And therefore it is very necessary that the right to question, the right to dissent is not only an inherent part of a democracy, but inherent part of the right to life itself. As far as democracy is concerned. If a country has to grow holistically in a manner, not only talking about economic rights or military might or anything, where civil rights of the citizens are protected, then there has to be a very important role for dissent. In fact, dissent must be encouraged because only it, if it is only through discussion disagreement and dialogue that we can strive for finding better ways to run the country. See this recent past there has been some unfortunate instance when any dissent, anything slap a case or term them anti-nationals and I can't do better than quote from what brother Chandrachut said recently about a week back in the Justice P.D. Desai memorial lecture. Incidentally, few months back, I was there in the validatory of the P.D. Desai, who I, without any reservation say, was the finest judge I have ever known in the, in the country, ever. The blanket, and I quote from what Justice Chandrasur said, the blanket labeling of dissent as anti-national or anti-democratic strikes at the heart of our commitment to protect constitutional values and the promotion of deliberative democracy, unquote. I don't think I can put it in, in better words. What is the essence of a democracy? That every person has a right to elect the government. So the ele government is elected by, well, a majority vote. But though majority, rule of majority is an integral part of democracy, in my view, majoritarianism is an antithesis of democracy. In a, 
especially in a country like India, where our democracy is based on the first past the post system, more often than not, those in power will not represent the majority of the voting electorate, let alone the majority of the people. But let us assume that they have got 51% votes from the population wise. Does that mean that the 49, other 49% now have to keep silent for five years and say nothing? Does that mean that those 49% have no voice for the five years? That they must accept whatever is done and not protest against it? So these, in a democracy, the government once elected is a government for the 100%. It's not a government for those 51% or whatever whoever, whatever percentage voted for them. It's a government for all the percent. So every citizen, whether he voted for you or did not vote for you, has a right to play his role in the democratic process. <coughs> the right to dissent, I mean, it can't be repeated more often, is one of the most important rights in a democracy. So long as a person does not break the law, encourage strife, or encourage violence, or secession, etc., he has a right to differ from every other citizen and those in power and propagate what he believes is his belief. This brings us to the role of the superior courts, who, as protectors of the rights of the people, have a duty to ensure that the powers to, that we do not suppress dissent or quell dissent. I again will quote from Brother Rohinton Nariman's small passage from Shreya Singhal's case where he talks about the chilling effect of censorship or something of this nature in, in, a, in point of law while dealing with section 66A of the Information Technology Act. In point of fact, and I quote, uh, sorry, in a point of fact, section 66A is cast so widely that virtually any opinion on any subject would be covered by it as, as any serious opinion dissenting with the mores of day would be caught within its net. Such is the reach of the section and if it is to be withstand the test of constitutionality, the chilling effect on free speech would be total. So if we quell dissent, if we discourage dissent, it has a chilling effect on free speech. The very essence of democracy is that every citizen has a right to participate not only in the electoral process but also in the way in which our country is run. This right becomes meaningless, meaningless if that person cannot criticize the actions of the government. The citizen is not a participant in the, not only a participant in the democratic process, he is an integral part of the country and has a right to express his views even if they be totally contrary to the views of those in power. No doubt these views must be expressed in a peaceful manner, but citizens have a right to get together and protest when they feel that actions taken by the government are not proper. Their, case, their cause may not always be just. They may be you know, pursuing a cause which is not actually uh, right, but then governments are always not always right. So we all commit mistakes. Merely because certain groups oppose those in power cannot take away their right to oppose what is proposed by the government or to oppose any actions of the government as long as the protest is peaceful and non-violent. The governments have no right to stifle or quell protests as long as they do not breach the law. Expressing of dissent by means of protest is the leg legacy left behind by Mahatma Gandhi, the father of the nation, in the form of a civil disobedience movement of Satyagraha followed, following the path of Ahimsa. So if that is there, there can be no disagreement with that form of dissent. Since a lot had been said on the importance of dissent, especially in Justice Chandrachow's speech recently, and my views are almost sim very similar to his on that matter, I thought that since time is at hand, I will take, break up my lecture into the second part where I talk of some, the importance of dissent in the decision making process in the judiciary. Before I bring, to, before I talk of the dissenting judgments, 
one thing i would like to talk about is i in the earlier part of the lecture i said that the bar associations are the most unholy of places but they are a shrine to one concept and they are a shrine to the concept of the rule of law i think nobody who belongs to the judiciary judicial fraternity can deny the importance of the rule of law and what is the rule of law it, the, the rule of law as a principle of governance like democracy and the separation of powers is an integral part of our body politic it is the golden thread which runs through our constitution anywhere any time when ordinary people are given the choice to choose the choice is the same freedom not tyranny democracy not dictatorship the rule of law and not the rule of men the bedrock of our democracy is the rule of law and this necessitates that we must have an independent fearless judiciary there can be no rule of law without a judiciary which is fearless and independent the we can have a rule of law when we have judges who can take decisions independent of political influence totally un uninfluenced by the media or any other extraneous considerations a free country is one where there is freedom of expression and governance by the rule of law when there is no sh sharing of power no rule of law no accountability there is abuse corruption subjugation and indignation when the rule of law disappears we are the ruled by the idiosyncrasies and whims of a few therefore why i am interwoven this is that rule of law is as important a part of democracy like dissent and then judges who interpret the law if they strongly feel that this is an issue on which they have to dissent they should not be scared to put forth their views in a dissenting judgment true it is that in any jurisprudence we like to have a constant law uh, not changing every day otherwise that leads to its own problems if every day uh, the interpretation of the law keeps changing then there's no certainty of the law which is also not desirable but in this fast changing world the views on any subject cannot remain constant the meaning of every word in the constitution the meaning of each word in any statute sometimes has to be given a different meaning a changed meaning as times progress you can't keep amending the statute or the constitution every time otherwise it would be something like nepal they have the 8th or 9th constitution now that is not proper we should have to have you see the the development a more dynamic interpretation to the con, uh, to the co constitution as well as the statutes to make it ensure that they may they are made workable given the circumstances as pointed out by mr roda in his opening remarks but we must know when to dissent dissent just for the sake of writing another opinion is meaningless dissent just for the sake of dissenting is also not correct J because judicial importance is probably as important if not more impo uh, judicial discipline is more important than the right to dissent in every matter you see when we when i sit as a judge there are so many three judge decisions or five judge uh, judges decisions which may i may feel may not have uh, laid down the correct law but that is my feeling as deepak gupta when i sit on a two judge bench or a three judge bench i am bound by that judgment and that is how it should be It, not every case should be referred at the drop of a hat that i take a different view so send it to five judges or seven judges and think the law on this regard is very clear but when you have to dissent when important issues are involved then if you and if you have to take that step all alone by yourself that should not come in the way of the judge of dissenting and i can only i am not too good at bang bangla so i will not attempt to read the original but only quote from tagore's ekla chalo re that open thy mind and walk alone if you are even even if you are all alone and nobody joins you you must walk alone because that is if you have, have to be true to our oath then if we, even if we have to walk alone we should not hesitate to so dissent is a very powerful a tool in the hands of judges but it has to be used with great responsibility and restraint 
there's no idea of dissenting only to manufacture a dissenting judgment. But a good dissent sows the seed which develop a new thought and which may at a later stage develop into a totally new approach to law. Before I talk of the various dissenting judgments which I have referred to, uh, there are two from the US, one from UK and uh, a few from India. The first is Plessy versus Ferguson. This was where a challenge was made to the slave trade and whether these, I mean unfortunately uh, uh, I am using the term a very a, a term which should not be used now but since it is in the judgment is whether Negroes could be called citizens of the country. Now that by a majority of 7 to 1 they held that they have no right to be called citizens. The 1856 in the first judgment. The dissenting judgment John Marshall, Justice Marshall said, in the eyes of law there is in this country no superior dominant ruling class of citizens. There is no caste here. Our, cons our constitution is color blind and neither knows nor tolerates classes among citizens. In respect of civil rights, all citizens are equal before the law. Unquote. Now, that is in the context of a constitution. Please remember it is more than 150 years back when societal norms were totally against what this judgment had written and later this judgment became the law of the land. Again in they began in Brown versus Board of School Education. Then there's a famous Dred Scott skate of 1896 where a slave who had lived in some free territories of the US came back to a territory which had slavery legal, uh, slavery as legalized and said that he was a free man. But again by majority it was said a Negro whose ancestors were imported into and sold as slaves cannot claim any rights. So first was where they had different you see segregation by way of separate compartments in trains and the second was when they, they were slaves. But still in both these cases later the Supreme Court of England took a different, uh, the United States Supreme Court took a different view. But one of the finest dissents ever is that is by, of Lord Atkin in Liversidge versus Anderson. And must, one must remember this happened in 1941 when the Second World War was at its highest, when the Blitzkrieg was having its effect in London day in and day out. They were being bombarded night and day. And the question arose about the lit liberty of a person whose, uh, whose loyalty to England was highly questionable. And Lord Liversidge said in England among, amidst the clash of arms the laws are not silent. They may be changed, but they speak the same language in war and in peace. It has always been one of the pillars of freedom, one of the principles of liberty, for which on recent authority we are now fighting, that the judges are no respecters of persons and stand between the subject and any attempted encroachment on his liberty by the executive, alert to see that any coercive action is justified by law. But for me, not only is dissent very important, but also the way he said why he dissents. And again I quote Lord Atkin, quote, I protest even if I do it alone against a strained construction put on words with the effect of giving an uncontrolled power of imprisonment to the minister, unquote. So this was his views. As far as coming back home, Kopalan is the first case where the dissent of Justice Fazal Ali was remarkable for the time. We must remember that this was a time we had just become independent, the constitution was new and the Supreme Court reposed a great deal of confidence in the government. 
when it felt that the executive would not go against the people. The majority opinion in the case of Britain, preventing dissension was that if taking a very literal view of Article 21 of the procedure established by law, that once the procedure is laid down by the law, you can't question it. Justice Fazali said that, though not in so many terms, but the gist of his judgment was that even the procedure established must be a fair procedure to be in and should be in line with Article 14 of the Constitution. This judgment to those of you who have joined profession in the last 15-20 years would seem so unremarkable. But you would feel this is understood always. But please remember at the time when it was given in 51, it was a path-breaking judgment. And finally, this was expected, accepted to be the correct view in the back and rationalized case in R.C. Cooper. The second important dissent it was in Khadak Singh case, Justice Subarao's dissent, where the question was whether the right to privacy is a fundamental right. Now we all know that now it has been held to be a fundamental right, but that is many years later. But what he said is almost as if he sort of understood what a judgment is going to be given half a century later. And I quote from Justice Subarao's judgment, quote, as already pointed out, the right of privacy is not guaranteed right under our constitution. And therefore, the attempt to certain the movements, no, this was the majority, sorry, and this, this, sorry, I'm sorry, this is the majority, and the attempt to certain the movements of an individual, which is merely a manner in which privacy is invaded, is not infringement of a fundamental right guaranteed in part three. But then Justice Subaru held, it is true that a constitution does not expressly declare a right to, to privacy as a fundamental right, but the said right is an essential ingredient of personal liberty. Again, a judgment way ahead of his time, like many of others uh, judgments of Justice Subaru. I will be talking about the third very important judgment later on, but I want to deal with a few other dissents which I feel are very important. In the Shridhar Mirajkar case, where the older generation would know this, where uh, there was this litigation against Mr. R.K. Karanjia, the editor of the uh, Blitz for defamation. And Justice Tarkunde passed an order that the, that the proceedings of the court would not be reported. That order was challenged. And the issue that arose was whether the order passed by a judge or whether the judge is also susceptible to the, uh, to the writ jurisdiction and whether he is also bound by Article 14, 15, 14 of the Constitution. The majority held that the order was proper and the a judge could not, the order, decision of a judge could not be subject matter of this, such a decision. But Justice Hezayatullah held, these provisions show that it cannot be claimed as a general proposition that no action of a judge can ever be questioned on the ground of breach of fundamental rights. The judge no doubt functions most of the time to decide controversies between the parties in which controversy the judge does not figure but occasion may arise collaterally where the matter may be between the judge and the fundamental rights of any person by reason of the judge's decision. It is true that judges are the upholders of the constitution and the laws are least likely to err, but the possibility of their acting contrary to the constitution cannot be completely excluded." Unquote. This judgment is still a minority judgment, though orders have been challenged. But this is another judgment which raises a very, very important issue which maybe time will only will tell whether it will change or not. Then Justice Sinha's judgment in G.J. Telefilm's case, where he held that BCCI was state within the meaning of Article 12. Hmm? Yeah. So that is another very important dissent according to me, which though in the later two judge bench it was said that though it's, uh, 
another way of was go, uh, to go around it was found that they are uh, uh, doing some public function so they are amenable to writ jurisdiction. But the question whether such bodies are state within the meaning of Article 12 may sometimes be taken up again. Two recent dissents, one by Justice Chandrachud in the Aadhaar case and one by Justice Indu Malhotra in the Sabri Mala case are two very, very important dissents. But since they are both subject matters of, uh, uh, of judicial scrutiny, I won't say anything further than saying that these are very important dissents. That brings me to that greatest of dissents this country has known. The dissent by Justice H.R. Khanna in the ADM Chukla case. Again, before reading this dissenting judgment, one must go into the background. The emergency is on. Nine high courts have had the courage to hold that such laws, that, uh, that fundamental rights exist even during the emergency. And he is in line to be the next Chief Justice of India and knows, given the recent past history of 1973, that if he opposes the government, he is likely to lose his post. He still gave the dissent. And it is said that he told his sister one day before the judgment was pronounced that I have dictated a judgment and now I will not be Chief Justice of India. Huh? Huh. But anyway, he will not be. Huh, he says, My mini nokri gay. So. He knew that he was putting his future as Chief Justice of India at stake. Knowing the past history when three senior judges had been overlooked when Justice A. N. Ray was appointed Chief Justice. That did not deter him in doing his duty and delivering a judgment which even today has been acknowledged to be the correct position of law. I would like to quote a few lines, a few paragraphs from this judgment. First on what, is, what he said about preventive detention and the rights. I quote, law of preventive detention, of detention without trial is an anathema to all those who love personal liberty. Such a law makes deep inroads into basic human problems which we all cherish and which occupy prime position among the higher values of life. It is therefore not surprising that those who have an abiding faith in the rule of law and sanctity of personal liberty do not easily reconcile themselves with a law under which persons can be detained for long periods without trial. The other part of the judgment which I feel is very important is where again, like Lord Atkin, he again gives reasons why he is willing to dissent all alone. Before I part, and I quote, before I part with the case, I may observe that the consciousness that the view express, expressed by me is at variance with that of the majority of my learned brethren, has not stood in the way of my expressing the same. I am aware of the desirability of unanimity, if possible. Unanimity obtained without sacrifice of conviction commends the decision to public confidence. Unanimity which is merely formal and which is recorded at the expense of strong conflicting views is not desirable in the court of last resort. Then he quotes from, uh, I mean, Justice Khanna quotes from Chief Justice Hughes and says, a dissent in a court of last resort, to use his words, is an appeal to the breeding sp brooding spirit of law, to the intelligence of a future day when a later decision may possibly correct the error into which the dissenting judge believes the court to have been betrayed, unquote. I mean, this is the power of dissent, both in democracy as well as in the judiciary. The right to dissent, to conclude, includes the right to dis criticize. We all must be open to criticism. The judiciary is not above criticism. If judges of the superior courts were to take note of all contemptuous communications received by them, we would only be doing contempt work in court. At least I get 50 letters a day which are highly contemptuous. Not to me, but somebody or the other. Sometimes to me also. Criticism is always welcome. 
introspection should also be done regularly are we moving around the right path criticism of any institution whether it be the judiciary the bureaucracy the executive the legislature or the armed forces cannot be termed as anti national there is no holy cow as far as dissent is concerned in case we attempt to stifle criticism of the institutions whether it be the legislature the executive or the judiciary or other bodies of the state we shall become a police state which i'm sure our founding fathers didn't want us to be to question to challenge to verify to ask for accountability from the government is the right of every citizen under the constitution these rights should never be taken away otherwise we will become an unquestioning moribund society which will not be able to develop any further i can end only with my favorite poem of guru rabindranath tagore which has adorned my office since i became a lawyer since i entered but before that i just want to add two more lines i said that justice sai was one of the most the finest judge i have ever known he because there are many who may not have even heard of him he became a judge at the age of 39 in 83 when he was hardly i think 44 years old he became a judge chief justice of my court he matter he was our chief justice for 5 years for two and a half years he was chief justice of calcutta another two two and a half years he was chief justice of bombay high court for 11 years he was chief justice and one of the finest chief justices anywhere in any of these courts also and later refused to come to the court for any reason that's not the issue but as i said in ahmedabad or 6 months back he did the right things he did not play the cards right so i end up with that great poem of rabindranath tagore which is a tribute in a way to dissent where the mind is without fear and the head is held high where knowledge is free where the world has not been broken up into fragments by narrow domestic walls where words come out from the depth of truth where tireless striving stretches its arms towards perfection where the clear stream of reason has not lost its way into the dreary deserts sand of dead habit where the mind is led forward by thee into ever widening thought and action into that heaven of freedom my father let my country awake thank you jai hind thank you very much my lord for such wonderful speech and uh, the last part which is said introspection i think for students here it is very important to have that introspection when you have that introspection for students particularly i am not talking about the lawyer you must introspect why is it happening that after 72 years of independence 50% more than 50% children are abused out of which more than 50% are boys so you can't expect them to become doctors or engineers more than 50% women are anemic how many farmers have committed suicide how many students after getting admission into aims iit scoring 96% have committed suicide where is our human right index where is our corruption index all these thoughts are important when he says introspection before you dissent as socrates said he says lawyers when you join bar you must introspect where to join where is prashant bhushan where is paul where is sanjay parekh those who are talking of preamble as peter rightly said peterson that you are not to become a liability after studying law or any subject as gandhi said use your profession as a tool to serve so you have to think it over socrates said you can't teach anything i am not trying to teach you but at the same time i am trying to request you that kindly introspect when you join bar why are you joining bar are you committed to preamble are you thinking on this that why after 72 years 50% children are being abused are you thinking or are you not thinking on that if you really want to be 
an asset to society. As my Lord Justice Deepak Gupta rightly said, only when you challenge a thought, when you challenge a thought, you become Khusro, Kabir, or Ghalib. When you don't challenge a thought, you become run of the mill. You become run of the mill. Ki kya kare Seth ji kya karana me kar gaye, paida huye, BA kiya, vakil bane, paise banaye aur mar gaye. No. No, my dear friends. This is the right time to dissent. And if you actually want to reach that, if you actually want to reach Socrates, where he says, where are those lawyers who are boasting of their oratory and are not concerned about this man? He talks in the language. It, hundred years after that, our shire says, Ki is sadi mein tere hoton par tabassum ki lakir hasne wale tera patthar ka kaleja hooga. Patthar ka kaleja ban ke nahi ban na hai If you want to be a lawyer, become an asset to society. Challenge everybody. Challenge a policeman. Ki aapne madam se kaise baat kari hai. Challenge a judge. My lord, how can you do this? How is it done? So, thank you very much. Let's see. When you dissent, you would be suffocated. My vice president is suffocating me. Ashok, Ashok. This would happen. This happened to Socrates. This happened to Galit. This happened to Kabir. This happened to Surdas. And my vice president is telling me, Ashok, Ashok. When I am trying to talk to you, trying to tell you, trying to make you think. That when you join bar, think 10 times whether to join Prashant, Paul, Sanjay Parikh or somebody who is just making money. I am there for you friends. I am very thankful to my Lord Justice Deepak Gupta. I now request our President Dushan to say concluding remarks. And be in touch. My, I know, you know, sometimes they would suffocate me, some of them. My talks are there on YouTube. You watch that. Ashok Arora, you just type this name. As they say, Practice what you preach. My dear friends, I share with you and I share some of those who are trying to suffocate me. 96, imagine. 96. On a humorous note, I must tell you, I am not as young as I look. I look very young, but I am not that young. 96, 24 years back, I was saturated in profession when I represented Ashok Sen and Jethulani. And that time I thought I'll give 99, more than 99% time I give to student and society. And still some people, your own colleagues would try to suffocate you when you're trying to talk to students on something very important. Which my Lord Justice Deepak Gupta, the gist you take home, my suggestion is his, his suggestion of introspection. Introspection. Apne dil mein doob ke paaja surage zindagi. Tu agar mera na bana, mat ban. Apna to ban. Apna to ban. So this is important. I now call upon request Dushanji to say concluding remarks and vote of thanks. Dushan Dave. I think I must say that Mr. Rora, I am deeply grateful to you for at least allowing me to speak. Uh, <laughs> I was afraid that I may not get the chance at all and crowd might start going away. <laughs> but uh, uh, I, on behalf of the Supreme Court Bar Association, the Executive Committee and the Lecture Series Committee uh, headed by Mr. Chandar Uday Singh and other friends who have organized this outstanding lecture. Fortunately, this begins on a fantastic note uh, because uh, it's not just that we ha have a speaker amongst us who is an outstanding uh, individual, a great lawyer and a superb judge, but he's a man who speaks his mind. And in today's atmosphere of fear, what you have said is really going to warm up hearts of each one of us present here. And that is something which is really needed today. In your first pa part, you have really spoken about the dangers of killing the dissent, which is, uh, and, and the dangers that you have spoken of is extremely serious. And I think uh, your encouragement that we must speak up without fear is something which is going to really uh, go a long way uh, for us young people to really, uh, uh, you know, uh, emulate, perhaps, uh, you know, to carry it forward and try and speak as much as we can in dissent to what is happening in the country. So to that extent, your, uh, I think, uh, today's lecture perhaps will assume a great significance in times to come because there are very few people today in the country who are willing to speak up encouraging us to speak up. So you have encouraged us to speak up and that's something fantastic. The other part that you spoke about dissent in the judgments is equally important because, you know, uh, where do we have judges of the examples of H.R. Khanna or P.D. Desai today? They are not there. 
and your uh, real i mean you have rightly spoken that let's hope that judges also hear this uh, you know this uh, message and perhaps uh, you know we might get judiciary which becomes even more bolder than what it has been so far which perhaps will uh, go a long way in protecting the uh, democracy go a long way in protecting the rights of the citizens which is uh, the need of the day because you know we are seeing today that large number of innocent people are suffering because the judiciary is not able to stand up and give relief to them for whatever reasons and this nonsensical argument that these uh, you know innocent people are guilty of sedition or are guilty of anti national activities is something which is really troublesome judiciary has to rise and i do hope and uh, pray that we have more deepak guptas amongst us uh, amongst the judges I, so thank you very very much justice gupta it's been a great time uh, i also thank uh, the attorney general uh, mr venu gopal who is uh, i think the first amongst all of us and who is undoubtedly one of the not just one of the finest lawyers but one of the finest human beings that one can come across uh, 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 you know in life and uh, and and mr venugopal has always been extremely encouraging to the bar to the scba when i was first president he was uh, he was full of uh, you know advice and wisdom to the bar uh, i am no doubt that uh, uh, he will continue to do, do so he is really uh, i mean we are grateful that you uh, found time you came here one thing about him i mean we requested him to speak but dignified that he is he politely declined to say anything so thank you very very much for being here your benign presence has been extraordinary sir i thank uh, vice president mr kalash vasudev uh, chandaruday singh and his team uh, pro, uh, from the bottom of my heart but most of all i thank each one of you for being here because this is very important your presence here really tells us that you want to hear that democracy must have descended so thank you very very much have a lovely afternoon thank you Come on, Ashok. We may be dissenting, but we can be in the picture. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that get a new rise. A few days later, Jason Tadaj and 